All right. Well, this is the first the first uh, blog cast, I guess I'll call it, of uh, a series of, uh, of of these programs that I want to do that are uh, related to 15 years of blogging. And I've picked some topics that I focused on. I tend to get onto topics and ride them to death. And so here's uh, the first one we're going to take that a book came from. This book right here, Getting Jefferson Right. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, this is a response to a book by David Barton that was pulled from publication, The Jefferson Lies. We'll be talking about that, I think, a good bit here. And I've got with me today Michael Coulter, who's a colleague at Grove City College. He's a professor of political science, and I believe you teach humanities. Is that? That's right. That's right. And uh, we're, he's the co-author with me on this book. Uh, where we responded to uh, the historical misadventures of uh, David Barton. Uh, David Barton is uh, popular among uh, conservative Christians and politically conservative figures uh, for reasons that I hope we will be able to explain a little better as we get into this. Uh, David Barton published a book in 2012 called The Jefferson Lies, aptly named, and uh, we managed to get a hold of it and or early pre-publication uh, copy and uh, I'll let Michael explain some of the rest of that but uh, we uh, were able to write a response to it. Anyway Barton is uh, very popular among people who believe that America is a distinctly Christian nation and was uh, intended to be by God from the very beginning. So uh, uh, Michael uh, maybe explain a little bit about what you teach at Grove City College and uh, we'll talk then we'll get into uh, how we got into writing Getting Jefferson Right together. Great great well it's fun to be on uh, here today and it's been fun sort of rethinking a little bit of, of 2012 when that uh, when that work came out. Uh, so so I teach I've taught at Grove City College since 1995 and I a member of the political science department and my teaching has been sort of roughly half political theory and half American politics. So I teach courses like classical political thought, and modern political thought, and philosophy of law, and a course called political ideologies, and some courses in American politics like parties and interest groups, um, public policy, and state and local government. And then I also have taught uh, throughout my time here one of our required humanities courses uh, for a long time that was the modern civilization course. And for the past several years, it's been our, we switched it to a one semester Western civilization course. So, um, yeah, so I've taught, a, a, like many of us at small colleges, I've taught a, a lot of different courses, but mainly theory and American politics. And, and you asked, uh, I think you asked as well, how did we, how did I get involved in this or connected to it? Uh, the, uh, uh, both of us, <laughs> uh, and you a bit more than I, uh, used to have this particular spot where we'd sometimes uh, you know, get some work done, and it was McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and I remember uh, 2012 was my it's my first and only semester sabbatical, and I was finishing up a project uh, in uh, I had an editing project that I was uh, in the midst of and had to be finished by about mid to late February, as I recall, um, and then I was going to start work on another project as well. And I remember being at McDonald's one day um, in the morning, and you had asked some questions about uh, some church state questions, because that's really what drew you to, to, uh, mm -hmm. to David Barton, some of his work, sort of broader questions about uh, church state relationship. And I remember we just started having these conversations about it. And, uh, and then you had then, and really I hadn't heard, I mean, I knew a little bit of Barton and a kind of funny stories about a year after the, our, our little book came out. I found a copy of America's Godly Heritage on my third floor. Uh, I didn't even realize I had it, uh, which was an early, uh, like a video, uh, right. VCR yes. tape uh, produced by Barton. Right. Somebody must have given it to me at some point. Um, but in, in political science circles, truthfully, no one really reads David Barton. And in, you know, I, in, you know, I, uh, I'd actually proposed the course in American political thought. And then for some staffing reasons, I, di I didn't end up teaching it. Um, but it's an area of interest of mine. Um, and among the sort of scholarly community who looks at American political thought or the American founding, that 
they're truthfully not reading David Barton. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're talking about it. It's, it just operates in a different, a different universe. But so I had, um, I, I guess I, I think I had maybe heard of him, but not much. But what was interesting is when you brought him up and, and then you start, you look him up and you see people who are referring to him and you realize the guy had um, a, a, a sort of influence within certain circles of American politics and American culture. Um, that you know uh, that I I just wasn't aware of uh, until you really brought that up. Yeah, it is phenomenal, isn't it? That uh, that the, the the influence is so great, and I uh, I still you know I wonder if if it's as great today as as it was then. Uh, did Did you think that the the book would have the influence that it no, did? No. I, even I didn't. I mean, I I wanted to put all of the claims of that. We in, that I had investigated and others had investigated about Jefferson into one place, yeah. and uh, I felt like uh, you had some insight into some to some things that that I didn't have, and so it was a great collaboration. But I had no idea. No, no nor did I. And so let me actually say a few uh, words about that collaboration. Is and, and my memory may you know may not be perfectly accurate on this because no one's memory is. Right. But my recollection is, is that you had a long uh, word document that had some of your, your criticisms and analysis of sort of previous Barton claims. I think some of it was some compiled uh, uh, blog post. In fact, I, right. I actually think you had sent me some blog post in draft form right. uh, prior to this, uh, right. just to kind of show them to someone. And I remember sort of reading through them. I thought that uh, there's some really interesting criticism I and mean, truthfully political scientists don't really pay a whole lot of attention to the Jefferson Bible, for example, um, and just because it's a, an issue of, uh, of interest to more religious scholars or American religious scholars. But, um, but you showed me some of these and started reading through them, like, there's a lot here, and then um, you asked for some comments, and I remember like, either writing or, or uh, using Word, review function in Word and putting some comments on, and then, you know, we got... Uh, got to look at some of uh, or got the, the draft of, or the copy of Jefferson Lies and started going through it. And I was really drawn to some chapters more than others, mm. that is, of analyzing them, particularly like the slavery chapter uh, in, in, Barton's, uh, in Barton's book. And so it turns out like, I mean, there's some of the work that is, some of the, the final work that's clearly yours. And I think more than half is, is clearly yours. And there's some of it where I think our edits went back and forth so much that it sort of took our two slightly different styles uh, uh, together. And there's some parts that are probably more clearly mine, uh, but it was a really interesting collaborative project. And, and often in, in the humanities, it's, it's harder to do collaborative projects like this because writing is often a kind of individual act. Uh, but it really worked out, and timing wise, it worked for me because I just sort of wrapped up this, this one project. I was on sabbatical and I was, starting to work on another, but I was still waiting for some, uh, you know, some journal articles to come in and some other things. And so this was a sort of, you know, went back and forth between, you know, working on this project and, and the other sabbatical project that was uh, underway. So. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, especially the beginning, uh, the introduction where you talk about the, the role of the Christian scholar uh, in history and getting the facts right. I feel like that was a, a real strong contribution from you, and uh, then and, and that really uh, came back to us full circle when George Marsden came to Grove City College and oh, spoke yeah, that's right. about uh, uh, Christian scholarship. And uh, it, it was you, you know when you're in Christian academia, you you look for things to keep you going. And uh, getting a shout out from George Marsden, uh, you know, is a pretty good thing. Yeah. And, and I uh, recommend. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just would recommend to anyone watching this. It's a short, um, small book that George Marsden, the really eminent historian of uh, American historian, written called "The Outrageous Idea of Christian Scholarship," and it's a bit of a playful title. The outrageous that is thinking that. He's not saying it is outrageous, but that some had sort of presented it that way. But, um, you know, it is a call for, you know, um, like ex excruciating honesty 
uh, from, from scholars, um, from Christian scholars, and to not, um, you know, turn certain figures into saints and to use sort of a, a, a sort of misshapen or misrepresented history as a tool of evangelism. That's not what Christian scholarship is. Um, mm -hmm. And so Marsden's work, um, that, that's really what inspired me, that short little book. Um, but any of his work is, is, is worthy of, of sort of careful study. I mean, um, and so, Mar uh, so Marsden's a great example, and that was really fun to get that shout out. Mm -hmm. uh, but you asked earlier, like, did we expect this thing to have any impact? Um, you know, for the most part, scholars write criticisms of each other all the time. It's what we do. And it's normal part of the process. And that's kind of where you think it ends. You know, someone writes, makes a claim, others make a counterclaim, maybe there's a response. And, and that's kind of where it ends. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I've certainly never been involved with anything and, and I can't imagine ever will again, that leads to a book being pulled by a publisher. And uh, I actually remember where I were when you called me, when you found out that the book was pulled by a publisher. I was actually helping a friend stain his house, part of his house, of all places. And I'm like sitting there in like these clothes, you know, from, from staining. And I'm talking on my, on my phone. I'm just shocked uh, that, it, that it was pulled. Mm. And it's very rare. You know, there was a, uh, in, for scholarly works for something like this, there was a, uh, there was a book, uh, now forgetting the author's name, about um, sort of gun culture in American history um, uh, that was uh, based on fraudulent research and was pulled by its publisher mm -hmm. uh, probably a, in the early, two, you know, early first part of the uh, 21st century. Um, and, and that got a lot of attention in, um, you know, in some political science and history circles. And it got attention because it's so rare for a publisher to pull his book. Now, uh, that was an academic publisher that pulled it. And so not surprised in some ways because they have to maintain their reputation for accuracy and for good scholarship. Thomas Nelson is not an, you know, it's not an academic publisher. It's a mm. publisher providing materials really for Christians. I mean, I, I think that's more than fair to right. say. They oh, yes. Bibles and, and other sources, other, other publications. So it really struck me as a, as a particular surprise uh, that Thomas Nelson would pull the book from its, from its catalog. It was a best-selling book at the time, or at least I'd made the, the bestseller list. Uh, and uh, th that's, I mean, one of the things that uh, Barton has said in defense is that the reason it was pulled was because uh, Nelson was worried about political correctness, that uh, the criticism was of the thesis that Jefferson was a, uh, a more devout person. Well, yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, it, we, we did criticize that, but we criticized it for factual reasons and not, not because it was some political problem for anybody. And, uh, uh, you know, what publisher who has a best-selling book is going to pull it because it causes some yeah. scandal in the public. I mean, you know, publicity is kind of what drives everything. Sure. And, I mean, truthfully, uh, what publisher would pull something that's selling at all? Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. E even more than, uh, but right, this is sold. And this was a, a publisher who had a connection with a kind of particular constituency who would likely sell books in the future. So both in its, in both the Jefferson lies and oh, right. any, any future books, it could be a revenue stream uh, for Thomas Nelson. Right. If this book was good uh, or popular, I mean, no matter what the facts were, certainly the next one could be too. So yeah. they, uh, they cut off, you're right, they cut off a, a stream of potential revenue. So uh, it, it is extraordinary. It was, I remember where I was too. I had just finished a counseling session and, and uh, Bob Smutana, who now is editor at Religion News Services, he was with the Tennessean and uh, he had uh, noticed that the that the book wasn't being sold by Thomas Nelson, who's also based there in Nashville, and uh, called them up and they said, yeah, we just didn't think the facts were there. We'd gotten a lot of uh, uh, calls from historians and various people. And uh, we, you know, uh, he, and so he called, I was one of the first people he called was uh, to find out about, uh, you know, what do you think of this? 
So, um, yes, uh, it was uh, not something I necessarily expected, although certainly I think we both agreed that it was the right call for them to make. Well, one thing that really strikes me is is I would love it if Jefferson, for example, were were really consistently anti-slavery. Like I, I wish that Jefferson, in fact, freed all of his slaves right. and was – uh, uh, and that would be a great story to tell, but the problem is it's not a true story. Right. And, and so, um, you know, and, and then it makes it worse, right, for those who, who want to defend that there are some, you know, uh, laudable elements of the American founding is, is if someone gets presented as, uh, you know, uh, as falsely for being sort of completely good when, in fact, you know, he had this really significant problem. And uh, so, so I, in some ways, I don't know, I, I, it's hard to get in what is the motivation for Barton here. Um, but if he thought that he was doing a service to the, to the, the sort of principles of the American founding, it, it's sort of the, the opposite. Mm. You know, uh, by presenting some, you know, someone like Jefferson falsely, it undermines the case. You know, then you end up doubting anything that could be useful um, or that's important or, you know, a universal principle, let's say, uh, from, from Jefferson. Yeah. Now, you know, the, these, whatever the real motivation is, there's an audience for this. And clearly the book was selling and, and he's got a, a base that uh, you can uh, go to and he continues to go to and others like him. I mean, he's certainly not the only one. So what, what do you think is, driving that what what are people attracted to in the the christian nationalist project yeah uh, you know here i i am partly have been influenced in the last several years from some of the research and work of jonathan height um yeah. and uh, uh height uh has made a pretty pr uh, persuasive argument uh from his uh, from his work as a social psychologist um and moral psychologist that um as human beings, we, we seem to form teams. We're fundamentally groupish, is, I think is the way he puts it. Mm -hmm. And we like things that support our team, and we, think we like things that are critical of the other team. Right? Uh, and now that, that seems overly simplistic, uh, but it does help to explain a lot of human behavior. And I think in one way, this, if you're on a, a sort of you know, team Christian America, and what I mean by that would be like, if if it if you find it a kind of supportive narrative that helps you understand the world that America was a kind of particularly Christian nation and that uh, God sort of set it apart for this special role in the modern world, um, it, it would support that view and provide confirmation to your existing positions, your priors uh, that. Uh, that Jefferson was, in fact, has, uh, you know, more Christian than we've realized, more anti-slavery than we realized, right? It would, uh, it would bolster support for that for that narrative, and so I think that's one reason why people are attracted to it is it, it supports a narrative, an account uh, of how they sort of generally are inclined to think about America, and this provides sort of evidence that we like if you're in that if you're in that position, and. Um, and it gives it a, it sort of makes it even less complicated. That is, it makes it sort of simple and clear that, you know, that the American founding has been maligned, uh, you know, by, you know, academics or journalists or somebody. And, and we're here to, you know, here speaking as Barton, but like, I'm here to, to, to point out the real truth. Uh, so I think that's part of it is like the, the interest is it supports a, um, a pre-existing, a, a pre-existing narrative. Um, I also think there's something that, that people like to buy books that like, you know, tell you the real truth, you know, that, uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, like, uh, we're going to, you know, everything you thought, you know, I, I think there's, I've seen a dozen books that had the title, something in the title or subtitle of everything you thought about X is wrong. Right. And, um, so I think there's also something, in, you know, we're sort of drawn to those, uh, to those kinds of works. Yeah. I can, I, it makes me think of, a video of uh, the Family Research Council posted of one of uh, the capital tours that David Barton leads. And in the middle of that tour, there's a, a pastor who said, uh, 
you know, we've been lied to <laughs> by, by historians, he, he's thinking, that we have been told the truth about our nation's founding. And I thought how ironic that he is saying, just after listening to the Capitol tour, which in five minutes has about eight lies about the, the historical facts, we've been lied to. Well, yes, you have been in lied to. the last to. five minutes. Yeah. Just the last five minutes or however long the tour took, you, you have been. Uh, I, I think to, to go back to your point about uh, height and the tribes and the teams, I think the other thing that in times of trouble, having the explanation about why things are good also lets the, the, the individual try to figure out how to fix things when times go wrong. You know, if there's a, uh, a reason why we're doing well or doing great, it's because God made a covenant with America. Then when things are bad, how do we fix it? We get back to God. And I think that's one of the things that it sounds very simple. You can put it in a slogan, you know, bring America back to God or go to the, the verse in the Old Testament that talks about if my people humble themselves and pray, then everything will be okay. Even though that verse is not directed at all toward a nation, America, that isn't even in the Bible. And so, you know, these kinds of, these kinds of loosely uh, developed theological statements seem to appeal to that, that, the tribe that you're talking about, because it gives us not only an explanation for what's good, but also how to fix it when things aren't so good. And we've had a lot of times like that. Right. I think it's a very good point. I think it also, uh, there, there's also this appeal is that uh, there is a, a, you know, a narrative that public education has you know, systematically misled people. And so there has to be a corrective to that. And so when someone comes along and says, you weren't taught these things in school, right, um, that there's a, there's a kind of appeal uh, to that. Now, I mean, one reason why it's not taught about what was the first Bible published in America or, or um, you know, who owned which versions of the Bible or something like that, in part because there's a lot more, there's a lot of important things in American history and you have to, to sort it out. And, and uh, you know, it was interesting to see, like, so, so some of these things are just not talked about typically in, in except in very specialized sources. So, so for example, um, like the so, so it's so it's easy to sort of like people wouldn't realize that these things might be wrong. I was thinking of the some of the treaty language um, there was that Jefferson used or or may have used, and, and we we talk about this in the book that the language had it was this very formal language that makes reference to um, uh, to God and, and these these very formal things. Well, they truthfully they wouldn't be talked about by political scientists or historians because they're not sort of crucial elements in Jefferson's life or his presidency. They're really sort of uh, formal uh, ways of writing. And so I think it would be easy to catch like, oh, the, nobody's really talked about this. And here I'm showing you this almost secret knowledge uh, that, that's, being, that's being produced. Uh, so anyway, I got a little off track, but, but the, I, even like we also typically don't talk about why statues or paintings are at the Capitol building. Right? It's a particular designer or architect. Uh, and usually those things, um, uh, you know, are sort of on the, you know, on the broader scale of American politics, they're not that significant. Um, and, and so it's not a surprise that, again, academics or political scientists or historians aren't going to talk about those things. Well, and at the time, they weren't uh, significant. They were they were part of the narrative. They were part of what happened at the time, yeah. but uh, they, they didn't make the news at the time. They weren't front page news. It right. wasn't something everybody was talking about. Um, I certainly pity future historians trying to sort out what was important uh, today yeah. uh, from looking at what trends on Twitter uh, or some such way to figure out what's important. But that's part of the historian's job, isn't it? To to take a look at what what made something important and critical to the time. And and that's exactly right. David Barton takes a look at back and he finds something like, well, the Congress made a commendation for a guy who printed a Bible and lost money on it. And it really, you know, nobody hardly knew about it at the time. 
and it didn't mean a whole lot to anybody at the time. But he picks something up, you know, embellishes the facts. First of all, the Congress printed the first English language Bible in the in the America. Well, no, they didn't actually do that. But he, he kind of twists words to make it seem like they did. And then he makes it seem like some monumental event that the people at the time were amazed about. Well, no, none of that is actually factual. There's there's some there's some kernels of truth in all of that, but he makes a narrative out of it. And then people uh, who like the narrative, like you say, they they it fits their their hope about uh, their their belief about the country, then they pick it up. But then here's the thing: once you show them the truth. And I'd like your thoughts on this. Once you show them, no, that, that didn't happen that way. It wasn't that important then. Then they say, well, we're still a Christian nation. Well, this other stuff's got to be true. Or even, I've had this happen, of course. You're, how do you know? You're just, you're making it up. This confirmation bias stuff is, is hard to get through, right? It's a powerful drug. Right. I mean, and, and being a playful way to put it there, but mm -hmm. like it's, it's really hard. And this is a little bit depressing for academics is it's hard to convince people of a different position, even if you sort of line up all the facts. Um, and that's part of Haidt's argument in, in the righteous mind is that it's, um, you know, that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it's not always so simple to kind of change people's positions. In fact, it's, it's almost impossible. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, in the sort of culture of, of academia, uh, you know, we think that people will, you know, shift their positions based on, on what the facts say, or as new evidence becomes available, as we find more out about the context, for example. And uh, in part, that's because we're sort of trained that, that way, right? To, um, and I might say that's the sort of the culture, but, uh, um, but I think in the world at large, it's not, it's not, it's very, very hard to get someone to, um, uh, to shift position, even if a lot of evidence, you know, suggests otherwise. Yeah. Um, and in some ways it becomes, uh, uh, in a certain sense, it becomes personal. Like, like, I think when academics, when we disagree, we might say it's business, right? It's not personal in, in that sort of playful sense of it. Um, and, um, but, you know, for, for many people, these are sort of, uh, you know, they see it as a sort of personal attack to say, well, you, you misunderstand the context here, you know, that the reason a, a church got built for this Indian tribe was part of a, a very specific um, treaty that was negotiated or, you know, you know and, um, but, but it, I think the, the broader problem uh, is that it really, uh, it undermines like the sort of searching for historical truth. Mm -hmm. Do you think, uh, do you think Barton is as popular today as he was say in 2012? Yeah. So interesting. In 2012, I, I started asking students and, and shortly thereafter uh, how much they had heard of David Barton. And again, you know, we're at a you know, small Christian college um, and with many students who've been homeschooled. And not all, but actually, a, it would surprise me how many had been familiar with Barton. Okay. Uh, that, that caught me a bit by, by surprise. Now, I haven't asked in, in, in recent years, but I would, have to, I would guess that fewer are um, uh, familiar with him. Like, he doesn't seem to have a significant social media presence in the way that some other figures do. Uh, he, you know, he may still have loyal following and speakers, but, but even those I don't really hear about you know, quite so often. Mm -hmm. And I think there are other younger figures. Um, uh, you know, I think you mentioned to me someone like Charlie Kirk, who, you know, has a large social media presence. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, Candace Owens. Uh, Candace Owens to a degree. I actually think it's sort of more Kirk. And Kirk has this, um, I forget the title actually, but he has a book about Western, um, no, it's Ben Shapiro has the book about Western civilization. But, um, uh, but uh, Charlie Kirk has tried to take his Turning Point USA into, into not just sort of, you know, uh, pure political activism in the sense of, you know, knocking on doors and making phone calls for candidates, but to 
but to try to present a kind of intellectual account of America. Uh, I think just a couple of weeks ago, he was talking about Plato and Aristotle, which caught me by surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so I do think younger folks uh, sort of tune in to those figures because, and here not to sound like, you know, grumpy old guy, but they don't read books. Right? And if your source of information is social media, mm -hmm. right, and these are important channels of communicating, people like Candace Owens and, and uh, Charlie Kirk have to uh, connect with younger people. And Ben Shapiro, for that matter, who I, who I think is actually better. I have lots of points I disagree with him, but um, on some things, but, but I think he is more scrupulous about some of his claims, uh, you know, really is influential in, in social media. For example, like his, he has a, a podcast that's almost every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has really, a, I was surprised recently to see how many uh, subscribers he has to his podcast. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so I do think some other younger, younger figures, I think the other part of this is that as a percentage of the total population, uh, evangelicals constitute a smaller percentage. And then among evangelicals, uh, you know, those who are sort of commit, you know, who have a, a you know, sort of general orientation to a kind of Christian nationalism would even be smaller still. That is, so it's important and vocal, but it's a smaller part of the population. Even so, some some of the studies I've seen that have tried to sort this out uh, show some connection and association between Christian nationalism beliefs and Trump support. Have you have, seen that? I, yeah, I've seen those, and I, I've it's a little bit a while since I've uh, read some of those articles. Although there was one not that long ago, uh, and what they do is they take a look at 2016. Uh, data, look at some exit poll data, and so they can look at individuals, and they try to see what is like the, the what looks like the causal link between beliefs and voting for uh, voting for Trump, and, and there is a clear connection, like certain issue positions, um, and uh, uh, like um, and certain you know whether how much they strongly agree or whatever how they agree or disagree with certain kinds of statements, so. Uh, holding to certain views of Christian nationalism, um, you know, and, and including some of those would be like strong positions against immigration uh, and concern about um, Muslims, uh, you know, Islamophobia, as, we, as it gets called. The, um, those seem to be really strong uh, connections between, you know, holding those positions and, and voting for Trump in 2016. So, um, so a, you know, I, I don't think this is, you know, a majority of, uh, of even, the, I think it's a large portion, maybe even a plurality of the Republican Party. I don't think it's a majority. Uh, but, uh, 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 and, and I think it, it ha like, these are like the, the true believers in that, you know, that, that Trump is, uh, you know, going to protect and, and keep America as a, as a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, I, I'm, I'm reminded of there's some there was some painting that was sort of circulated an image of like Jesus with his sort of arms around somehow or hands on the shoulders of Donald Trump in the Oval Office uh, that sort of seemed to encapsulate that that position uh, and I don't remember anything like that from you know the religious left with you know Jesus beside Obama or the religious right around George W. Bush. I mean, uh, or even I don't remember anything like that, you know, from, you know, that was produced during the Reagan period. Um, uh, so, th so this sort of like very strong connection between a kind of conception of Christianity and a candidate uh, is, is a little new. Mm -hmm. Do you, so you don't see any of that in the other Christian traditions. Uh, how about, you know, Catholics, conservative Catholics, uh, do they see him as a chosen vehicle or not? Uh, not, no. I mean, like they might see him as, as politically useful, you know, appointing judges who will protect life. Right. Uh, but uh, in uh, American Catholicism, it really has not been the language uh, like, the, like the, 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 the narrative of America as a kind of distinctly Christian nation really isn't part of, even like conservative uh, Catholicism. And uh, so Catholicism has uh, sort of to oversimplify this, but it has a kind of 
conservative wing and a more liberal, you know, conservative political wing and a liberal political wing. And, uh, you know, different groups sort of emphasize different you know, political issues. Um, but they don't see a particular candidate as like reviving America as a Christian nation. And, and that makes sense in the sense is that for the most part, America was, pro, you know, almost entirely Protestant at the founding, you know, some Catholics in Maryland and, you know, a handful here and there. Um, and that, in fact, uh, among some conservative Catholics, they're very critical of, like, the emphasis on religious freedom that's in, in American history, or freedom of speech, uh, what today is gets called integralist. Um, and, in fact, there's a, you know, so there were some writings uh, well, from a pope in the 19th century that, that criticized what was called Americanism. But Americanism was associated with, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, like a sort of endorsement of Protestantism. Uh, so that made sense. So, so Catholics in general uh, have gravitated political figures usually for kind of issues and not for restoring a kind of Christian nation. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, Catholic social justice teaching will bring more Catholics into the, the, the opposition to Trump around this time around, or how do you yeah. see that in American Catholics? So it's interesting is that, um, uh, that, uh, and I should have re reviewed these numbers before we got on is that, um, uh, you know, you have, you know, American, uh, American Catholics are, uh, often look like the population as a whole, in terms of distribution of votes. And the, um, uh, and so you have a sort of a group of Catholics or a portion of Catholics that are particularly concerned about things like abortion, uh, for, uh, for example, and, uh, and appointing judges so that um, you might overturn Roe versus Wade. So that's a, a, a driving issue. And then some more social justice Catholics who are concerned about you know, uh, social welfare or access to health care, let's say. Um, and, uh, and I think you'll have, like, uh, uh, and these two groups are fairly uh, uh, you know, sort of set in their preferences. Uh, but, but I think this time, I think you will see a, a small but significant, I mean, in, you know, it could be five or 10 percentage points, but that's meaningful in this election right. of more Catholics voting for for Joe Biden, I mean, in part Joe Biden, you know, who is Catholic. Um, now he's not; he's clearly not a pro-life Catholic, or um, in that sense. But I think some Catholics will be drawn to uh, uh, the broader la the, the language of of social justice, and particularly the concern for health care. You know, in a, in, a, in, a, in the context of a of a pandemic, and the concern about uh, some elements that still exist of um, uh, of the Affordable Care Act, and, you know, if those are removed uh, at some point this year, um, as, and I think because of a greater awareness of, uh, of health care. And I think even among some Catholics for whom abortion is, you know, is a very important issue in terms of deciding their vote, they might have the sense of like, well, we've already appointed all the judges and, and we st we're still not seeing changes. You know, uh, what about act, you know, what about concern for immigrants and and concern for healthcare, I mean, and there's a very strong. Uh, and the other thing is interesting. Even among, uh, it cuts across both of those groups, uh, but a concern for immigration mm. uh, among Catholics, in part because of the American Catholics uh, have a closer connection to their, you know, to particularly from you know late 18th, late 19th century and early 20th century of, mm -hmm. of immigration. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, it's a, it's not quite as, uh, or it's a, it's a bit similar to the way. Mormons are actually quite sensitive on issues of immigration, uh, in part because of how much Mormons have traveled through their mission times and um, and uh, sort of connection with there's Mormon churches in Mexico. So um, uh, so American Catholics have uh, this concern about immigration um, in, in a greater way than than most American Protestants. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the, when you say most American Protestants, that's been what many commentators are looking for. Will there be a time when American evangelicals will split? Uh, it seems pretty strong still. Uh, they seem pretty strong still for Trump. 
but there is there has been this very small group of never Trump uh, evangelicals who are concerned for immigration, social justice, racism, and the like. And uh, you know, one one wonders what it might take to yeah. have that group grow. Right. And I wonder if this could be uh, what where that group might grow uh, would be in like mega churches that are in urban settings that draw younger people. I mean, this is one of the like if you're going to some of the interesting data. And here I'm thinking of um, uh, Robert Putnam's book, uh, American Grace. Uh, this is with uh, with uh, David. Um, for the, the Notre Dame political scientist, I'm forgetting his last name, let's stop my head here, but uh, this is a very interesting book about American politics about 10 years ago it came out. And it's making an argument about, you know, why are younger people in particular seem to be dropping out of organized religion, trying to explain why there's a, a greater portion of the population who identify as none. And, and they make a pretty persuasive argument that young people, uh, are not as drawn to some of the uh, the cultural issues, uh, abortion or gay marriage, let's say, and uh, and so if there are people trying to reach those younger people, right, those twenties and thirties, who have sort of drifted from organized religion, um, and they form churches that are, uh, you know, more inclusive, more urban, um, it seems to me that that could be a growth area of uh, sort of non-Christian nationalist uh, uh, American Christians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I, you know, the, the thing that uh, keeps coming to my mind is that that those younger people get their a lot of their information, and we talked about this before from social media. And social media is um, how do you tell the how do you tell the truth? I mean, how do you? How do you figure that out? And uh, and so I don't know if you, you know, we're getting near the end of our, our talk. And, uh, you know, if there, th this is the, the difficult question. How do you tell how you, know, you got any advice to I, kind of weed through the these historical claims or the these uh, nationalist claims? Because they do come up and and uh, people who might feel for social justice they might really be they know they're 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 anti-racist they don't they don't want to reinforce that that impulse in the society but they hear we're a christian nation we need to vote for pro-life candidates we need to do this we need to do that and they see a lot of misinformation on the internet how do they sort through it uh, that's a, obviously a, that's a long and complicated question. Um, and I think about that's this. Sort I saved of, it for last. Well, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> no, I think about this for my own relatives. I interact, my children who engage, and this is, you know, and this is truth claims from, from both the right and the left. Exactly. Um, right. And my general advice, and I'm not sure how useful it is, is be skeptical of almost every, everything you hear. I, I mean, like, um, you know, it's, you know, um, and so uh, I, I've had a kind of discussion with some of my kids at times who will like show me something they've read and like, dad, do you think this is true? And I'm like, my usual thing is we should sort of like the default position should be, it's almost probably not true. Right. And so it's almost like we switch the default here is that um, um, now the problem that becomes is that it does sort of lead to a kind of general skepticism about claims is yeah. that everybody's just making things up. Um, but, um, uh, and so, you know, so sometimes, um, like if anything, I have a kind of question of like, well, what's the motive that someone would use, you know, if they'd want you to believe this. Right. And uh, if it seems like there's a kind of clear motive to lead you to vote for someone or to buy something, uh, then, then sort of my next default position is definitely don't, you know, you know so it seems as a, as a kind of sort of tool for gain uh, in that sense. Um, but uh, the problem is it's so easy, or the challenge maybe, yes, but it's, if the challenge is it's so easy to consume social media. That is to read a book or back in the day, you know, when we were younger to go read a newsletter or, or a, you know, like a, have an organization send you a newsletter. That took a lot of effort. You had to get on their mailing list, and to show up at your house, you had to open it up, and 
uh, now it is just it's just it's at your fingertips when you are you know scrolling endlessly um, and you know something like Instagram where you know you can have these short little video clips that are easy to watch right it takes no effort uh, virtually no effort and so um, so I think the challenge here, like, you know, we would say there's always been a challenge of confronting falsehood or attempts to, to uh, you know, uh, lead people astray on, on claims. Uh, uh, you know, it may have come in at a trickle before or you had to go to effort to, to, to see those claims. Right? Um, and, uh, but, but now it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's, you know, it just, it, it is a giant sprinkler system. You can't <laughs> avoid it. Uh, I don't know if that's the right image, but, but yeah, so, um, uh, and, and I know, and I should say for sometimes for students or my own children, uh, uh, you know, like anything that's been forwarded by somebody, uh, I don't, you know, like that's sort of an easy, I think that's a decision Place rule that's fairly easy. Yeah. Right? So if it's been forwarded to you and it doesn't look like um, that, that it's attributable to someone, you can figure out the source, uh, then you should just disregard it. Like I, I, someone I remember was posting, you know, literally the guy was uh, Doc Graham who was telling us it was bad to wear masks, right? And okay. so who's Doc Graham? And the only thing I can think of is I'm pretty sure that's the guy who was Moonlight Graham in the Field of Dreams was Doc Graham. <laughs> um, but I didn't go back and double check. Maybe Dr. Welby. Like, yeah, Dr. Welby, yeah. So like, <laughs> If that's your source, then you shouldn't. Uh, um, but I think it also feels good, like if we think something that confirms our bias, I think we like to share it because we think then other people will share our our, our positions. Um, I, I mean, in some way, like uh, again, we've always had false claims, uh, um, it's, or people making claims to support their positions. But we really are in sort of unprecedented territory in terms of how easy it is um, like to, to, to disseminate those. And, um, yes. and, and I don't, um, uh, uh, you know, I think this is a challenge for, for democratic discourse, like how we talk about issue claims uh, in the modern world. Uh, I, I, and, and uh, you know, so, you know, again, maybe just a, I haven't gone on too long at this point, but I remember, you know, running into like a conspiracy theorist and he'd like have to hand you a couple of books or something, you know, when I was 20. And um, that took a lot of effort. Somebody had to print and pay for those, right? Uh, uh, I only finally got rid of that. That book was None, Do None Dare Call It Conspiracy. It was a kind of famous sort of mm -hmm. conspiracy book yeah. in, the, in the 60s or 70s. But uh, but that took a lot of effort, to, even though those might be cheap, but somebody had to, uh, to distribute those and print them. Uh, but this is so much easier. So, uh, so I guess my default rule is distrust, right? Um, and, you know, uh, and verify. So Reagan famously said, trust, but verify. I guess I would, maybe I'll modify that and distrust and verify. Right, right, yeah. uh, so. And yeah, and fact check. And if you, and if you uh, hear a claim about uh, Jefferson, uh, this would be a good place to go because we yeah. have fact check. I, I tell you, if I if I could thank David Barton for something, <clears throat> it would be that I learned a lot about fact checking by by taking on some of those claims. I was amazed, and I just want to say, uh, you know, not for mutual aid uh, or a mutual admiration society here. But what I really was amazed is your effort to kind of track certain claims down. <laughs> like, so sometimes with Barton, you have two sentences and there's five claims sort of all kind of tangled together. And you have to kind of pull them apart in strange ways that was hard to find. Um, and then, and so it sometimes took like a detective, you know, to kind of track them down. So whether it was language and treaties or who's printing Bibles or subscription list to buying you know a, a newly printed edition of the bible uh, I, I know for me like uh, one of my favorite moments uh working on this thing was finding the text of the law for the um that enabled virginians to free their own slaves yes and 
I, I can remember this as clear as day. I, I sort of, oh, I got to track down the text of the law because he quotes it. And just being utterly shocked at how he used ellipses to change the meaning of the quote. Right. Yeah. And no one's going to, I mean, it was actually slightly hard. I mean, not that hard, but it was a little bit hard to find that, uh, the, the exact text of the law that we had confidence of wasn't sort of produced by somebody else. And I mean, um, uh, and so, and I even had, there was another, there was a guy who wrote a book about slavery in Virginia that I emailed him who, yeah. who sort of put me on and gave me a tip to find some sources. Um, but, but this fact checking is it takes sometimes not just your own sleuthing about the internet, finding primary sources, but sometimes finding other scholars, staff members at the Jefferson, um, uh, the Jefferson at, uh, at Jefferson at Monticello, Monticello kind of yeah. can point you in the right direction and find uh, uh, and help you find sources to verify. But I, I um, but so the importance of like the sort of slow methodical fact checking is you were a great example of that. And it was, it was fun to kind of thank you to do that. And, and, and not, I mean, for the most part, Barton was wrong all the time. He got a few things right, but yeah. but the, but the point is that even at, you know the the what he got wrong far outweighed what he got right. Yes, and some of the things that he got wrong, I I don't know how they could have, I don't know how he could have missed it, because yeah. it, just take the slave law. Yeah. If you had a copy of the the law, you had to deliberately omit oh. those words. Because once you have it, they're there. And and I mean, unless somebody gave it to him with the ellipsis and he didn't bother to see, I wonder what was there. What, yeah. where, could there be anything in the, that was there once? Yeah. And so, you know, when you see the law and you see, no, Jefferson could have freed his slaves. Yeah. Um, and, and he had to deliberately take those words out. That's what really oh, yeah. kind of turns me on to say okay we got to track down more of this and be skeptical like you say when you get a claim just because somebody says they're a christian just because somebody has a reputation and a following mm -hmm. i remember family research council said he has more followers than you <laughs> well, so what <laughs> does that make him right obviously not and so, uh, you know, you've got to you've got to just do it yourself and do the work, and check out the sources. And I should say that only makes the founders look bad to have it come out that you presented them wrongly. I think it makes Christians look bad as scholars, right? That you know, so some a a non-believing person might end up lumping, you know, careful scholarly Christians in with. Uh, I don't know, sloppy ideological because and you're you're right on this point that the the misquoting of that law that enabled Virginians to free their slaves that was not that had to be intentional that, that, there's there's no way around that unless I guess somebody gave him the law, uh, a copy of the law with it, the ellipses in it um, but the plainest obvious reading of the law was different than the way he presented it. Uh, and it didn't take a PhD to figure that out. I mean, truly, anyone was sleuthing around and you know trying to find the actual source. Uh, which is the funny part about this with Barton is that one of his claims to support his um, his authority is that he has all these these primary sources. He has the, this largest personal collection of 18th century books, which I always found kind of odd as a claim because uh, you can get everything. You, know, you don't need a paper copy of a book published in 1850 because it's available, uh, you know, it's reproduced on the internet. Uh, and, and the book isn't even filled with, there are very few uh, references to, you know, 19th century books in, in Jefferson Lies. Right. Um, right. So. right. The, the sources from his library, um, there aren't very many of those yeah. uh, cited in Jefferson Lies. And of course we would know because we looked, I think we probably looked at every single one. Yeah. I remember like finding a footnote and getting for interlibrary loan or tracking down a book 
uh, and like, let's just read it in, uh, uh, in context. In fact, there was a, um, uh, there's a, uh, there was a biographer of Jefferson that he cites a bunch of times that I remember like getting that book through interlibrary loan because I, I hadn't been, you know, I hadn't read it before and sort of reading it along with, with Barton's quotations from it. Um, and, uh, you know, just the, the challenge of getting, you know, you can, it, it wasn't that hard to kind of pull out a couple quotes that would support his position. But as I recall, um, the larger context of that biographer of Jefferson had a had a different point uh, and a you know, sort of different view of Jefferson than what Barton was presenting. Right. All right. Well, I think we've uh, just about covered it. Uh, anything else you would like to add or uh, say here as we close uh, up? The, the uh, you know, it was fun and, and I, 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 working on that, on that project. Um, and I think it might be the only time I'm pretty sure that a reporter from Politico called me uh, while working on that. And, you know, as someone who writes on fairly obscure things, I'm, I'm pretty sure no one from Politico will ever call me about John Locke or, you know, about Catholic social teaching or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that was real. That was, that was fun. And I think also um, that some other non-scholars were interested in that project. I remember some African-American pastors uh, mm -hmm. were were uh, concerned about the misrepresentation of, of Jefferson and the slavery issue at the founding yes. that attracted them to some of your blog posts at first. Yes. So that was to me very fascinating as a, um, uh, a, part, a part of that, of that project. Yes, yes. I hope to have uh, Ray. Ray McMillian was a uh, pastor in Cincinnati. I hope to have him on for uh, one of these as well. So. Okay. All right. Well, Michael, thanks again. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day. You too.